Hello everyone, it is time for this week's live stream. Fritz is a sponsor of this channel. They sell salt mix and all sorts of additives, solutions, medications for salt water, fresh water, and pond applications. See that newly cycled tank with Fritzzyme Turbo Start 900. Or for older systems, dose Fritzzyme 460 like I do. Clean your glass, dip your corals, they have it all. Did you know they have a line of test kits now? Coral Magazine is the magazine I'm the executive editor of, and there's a code that you can use to save money on your magazine. I highly recommend that you read this magazine because I spend so many hours editing it, and I want to make sure that it's right. So, use that link, coralmagazine.com slash Mila's Reef, or I'm sorry, Mila's 23. Finally, as you can tell, I'm really organized today. I offer consultation services, so if you have a problem with your tank and you need some one-on-one -on -one help, I do that. I uh, basically encourage you to do a video conference with me. We can use Skype, we can use FaceTime, video inside Messenger, whatever works best for you so that I can see what's going on, help you address the problems and make those necessary corrections. I do charge $125 for that hour, but if we go longer, there's no additional charge. You can email me at sales at to schedule a session. And now here I am. <laughs> So yeah, I tried something new today. I, I was getting organized this week and I thought, what can I do to make this channel better on these live streams? And I thought, here's my chance to kind of do something interesting. So if you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, there's a countdown timer. Uh, what you guys have done in the past is you ask questions in the live chat and I don't ignore you. I just don't look at them because I want to stay on topic. If I was doing this the whole time, you would think I'm not really paying attention, am I? So instead, what I do is I look at the camera, I talk about my topic, and then after 40 minutes, an hour, I finally look at the chat. But I have this feeling that you guys are asking questions, but by the time I'm replying, you're gone. So with the countdown timer, you can tell when I'm about to tackle the live chat and answer some questions, and then we'll go back into the discussion again. And I just thought we'd try this. And uh, as Andrea pointed out, our great moderator, uh, what if you can't find your spot in the chat? <laughs> yeah, that is the one downside I haven't figured out yet. But I thought this has got to be better than nothing. So you've got something to watch on your screen and you're like, OK, he's about to get to the question. So you can also save those questions for that period. So they're actually bubbling up live at that moment as well. This week's topic is going to be about reef depression. And you might think, well, what the heck is that? And it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It is the fact that you get depressed with your reef. It's not going well. You're frustrated. And it kind of paralyzes you because you also don't do anything to solve the problem. And uh, I've been in this hobby since 97, so that makes this 27 years, right? And I'm currently going through it myself. So I thought this was a timely topic. I might have to call myself for my own consultation to get through this. I'm kidding. Um, no, so what's happening is I've been le losing some corals gradually uh, for the last few months. It's just been a little erosion here, a little erosion there, just slowly things are just going away. And I'm working on the Coral Disease magazine right now and I'm thinking, okay, my reef has all these diseases. That's the only thing that explains this. And you know, that's not really true, but there's definitely something wrong. And when you are in this, dis the, the, any kind of depression, what do you usually do? You avoid everything. You are depressed and you choose to just wallow. Yeah, stay in bed. You watch a lot of TV. Um, you don't want to talk to other people. Uh, you don't want to spend any effort on it because you're depressed. And it's kind of this vicious cycle. So to get out of a depression, what is the normal thing that uh, people do? Um, usually it involves you know, your best friends pulling you out of it. <laughs> you know, they're like, are you okay? What can I do? They come over, they hang out, they take you somewhere and they try to get your mind off of things. But depression is insidious and it stays with you for a long time. And when it root takes hold, it's really hard to get rid of. Now myself, I've never really had a problem with depression my entire life until the loss of Caitlin. And when she died, that just hit me in a way I could never have anticipated. And uh, I finally understood what it was because I just have a normal, uh, I'm not normal, a natural leaning toward positivity. I tend to look in the positive and everything. I tend to trust others um, more than I should. And uh, I just do the best I can to treat others the way I want to be treated. 
But when it comes to uh, being in a depression, it can really tear you down. And uh, as it's doing it, you know, of course, everything around you is collapsing because you're not doing your normal stuff. You're not staying on top of your routine. Things are piling up. You, you feel a sense of guilt. And now you have even more of a reason not to do things because, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, it's a snowball effect. So uh, what I did back after her death was I ended up doing three months of therapy and um, it helped me get back on my feet and I got back into my routine. Now, I um, really don't have a lot to complain about. I mean, honestly, you know, I, I have a job, I have a home and, uh, you know, I've got a great dog and, you know, the weather's great. <laughs> so I, I really shouldn't have much to complain about. But what's going on in my reef is bothering me a lot deep down in my core. And um, I haven't really addressed the problem. So uh, let's talk about what you can do to assess what's happening. Well, when you're looking at your tank and you see that it's got a problem, what is the problem, first of all? Can you, can you actually put a label on it or is it just the sense of unease? If it's a, something you can label, then what we're talking about here is, okay, I have cyanobacteria, the solution is what? And then, you know, you check the web and you, you know, or you check this channel and you're like, okay, well, Mark recommends ChemiClean or Red Cyano RX. And so you use that, you get rid of the cyanobacteria, you do a big water change, you get the skimmer under control and your tank is better and you feel better. I mean, that was an easy one. If it's green hair algae, that's just growing out of abundance, then, you know, I always recommend lower the phosphates first and then start ripping out all the algae you can by hand after a few days because it comes out more easily after night, uh, phosphate's down. And then put in a cleanup crew to start munching on it. But what if it's a situation like that I'm dealing with with two tanks? Caitlin's Reef has this stupid dinoflagellate situation that has not resolved itself. And it's been ongoing now for nearly two months. And my own reef, uh, my main 400 gallon, has been having problems with some SPS corals just going up in smoke, um, you know, or a piece of a branch goes up in smoke, is what I should say. It just turns bone white and the skin's gone. And then I turn around and I watch my chalices are just not happy and they're shrinking away. And I have a favite that has been slowly receding and just I'm down to just a little bit of life left. And I've just been watching it, which isn't exactly a solution, and uh, kind of scratching my head at the situation. Uh, I've gone through and cleaned certain pieces of gear but I think it's going to be time for me to literally rip out everything out of the system one by one and look for a, a cause. So I'm going to be you know, removing all my vortex and I'm going to open them up and clean them and swap them out with new heads and see if maybe there was a magnet that split open. Uh, when I did my recent ICP test, I got an email telling me that um, something had shown up in their test, but it's not part of the results. Um, trying to remember what they called it. Not cobalt. Um, ah, some kind of a metal. And so I, th the fact that he told me that gives me at least a direction to look because I just have not been able to figure out what's going on with this tank. And uh, so I'm going to look at probe holders. I'm going to look at um, the auto top off bracket that held, holds on magnetically. I'm going to look at the skimmer pumps. I'm going to open up the abyss pump. Um, I just cleaned the calcium reactor, so I know it's not that pump. Um, and I mean, I literally took the pump apart and cleaned it and saw it and visually inspected it, so I know it's not that. I'm going to look at my cleaning magnets. I'm going to look for anything that could have swollen and is possibly putting in something evil that is hurting corals gradually over time because that really, it does seem to be some type of poisoning in the water. And so I have to, not only did I need to be aware of what might have what the problem might be and now I kind of have at least um, a hint but the next step is going to be to go ahead and start scheduling the time to do this so it's the weekend you think oh we'll just do it this weekend well as you guys know I've always got something going on I always have something keeping me busy but I'm going to go ahead and I think later today after we're done with the live stream and after I take a little bit of a rest I'll go ahead and start pulling the, the uh, circulation pump magnets and uh, look inside those and see if maybe I've got I mean, wouldn't it be nice if it was just one of those? And we boom, swap out with a new one, problem solved. I also need to make a new batch of salt water, and I wasn't able to previously because of some tile work that was being done here at the house. And uh, because of that, I, I just couldn't 
run the hoses over the newly set tile that hadn't been grouted in place yet. That's all done. So I can go ahead and I'm going to pump out what's left of my old salt water just because there's about 50 gallons of water that's several months old just sitting in the container. I just would feel better having fresh salt water and get that container filled up with some new uh, RODI, mix up a new batch of salt water and have it ready for some bigger water changes because I think the reef's going to need that to get things cleaned up. I also have a product on the shelf that I sell that's called Metazorb from Two Little Fishies. And I can put that in the system somewhere in the sump, probably within the baffles, to help absorb any kind of metal that is in the water to get that out, to again, try and stop the losses and encourage new growth. Because, I mean, I have a whole reef full of coral. So to anyone else that just looks at it and go, oh, it looks great. But no, I'm seeing the big problems and I'm concerned about it. So it's been bothering me a lot. someone at my front door. If you don't mind, I'm going to put this on the screen for a moment and I'll be right back. And I'm back, look what I got. This is a ribbon for being a supporter of DFW Mass. It says the 23, 2023 sponsor partner of Dallas Fort Worth Marine Aquarium Society, uh, the Hobby Club, sponsor partner. I could wear it on my shirt. <laughs> so uh, I need a spot to put this somewhere convenient, somewhere in the background maybe. Let's see if I can hang it on a picture frame really fast. And by the way, I noticed I messed up the timer when I switched it off. Ah, oh, we were about to see it jump. Alrighty. That's okay. What we'll do is we'll just jump to the questions right now, and then we'll come back to the topic. So let me leap into that. My master plan was foiled. By the way, if you're wondering about my shirt, it's not dirty. <laughs> it's actually something that was told to me back in a, uh, a Magna probably five, six, eight years ago, and it was hilarious. And I was like, oh my God, I got to get that put on a shirt. So let's see. Um, I didn't ignore you guys. By the way, another thing I could ask you to do while you're watching this, if you can hit the like button, I know I'm supposed to say that occasionally, I never do. <laughs> but apparently that helps the algorithm share this video to the world. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for putting the link to Coral Magazine. I also put that in the video's description. Oh, no. You know, uh, W. Mars says, my Coral Magazine fell in the water before I had a chance to read it. Uh, we have not been printing them in a way where they won't get wet. Um, I should tell Matt that we need a waterproof magazine for, for the occasional accident because we're a bunch of hobbyists with water around us. Now, I'm going to assume that you were about to take a nice bubble bath. <laughs> Let me know, and I will get you a magazine sent out to replace the one that fell into the water. Uh, you can just email me at sales at milosreef.com, or you can reach me at marklevinson at aquaticmediapress.com. But I think the first one's easier, sales at milosreef.com, and I'll get you a magazine mailed out. Just let me know which issue it is, too. I've got a whole pile behind me. Let's see. All right, so I'm looking for questions in case there was... And by the way, I stuck this Fritz, th this Fritz thing over here. Uh, next to me because I didn't like that that doorway, doorway was there. <laughs> and so I just flung it. I was like, oh, that looks good. Uh, the problem is my camera's here and I'm looking over here. So I'm going to see if I can change this up a little bit. Maybe move this over so I feel like I'm a little bit more on camera. There we go. All right. Let's see. What else can I do here? Um, Rick says, something that worked for me with dinoflagellates. I raised nitrate and phosphate. I cleaned the first quarter inch of sand and added live rock enhance. 
add a little GFO, reduce the light intensity slightly, and added carbon. Well, Rick, I already have elevated nitrate and phosphate, so that's no problem. Uh, I did do some cleaning of the sand. I didn't add live rock enhance, so I could do that, which might not be a bad idea. Um, I don't use GFO. Um, I didn't really change my lighting schedule. I did add a UV, and I did change carbon weekly inside the uh, Shark Pro. And so that's a filter that hangs inside the tank, and that was trying to help. Now, this is not normal dinoflagellate. It's the kind that's stringy with bubbles. This is something that's more like a dusting on the sand, and it will not go away. And, you know, I lost the flame scallop uh, 10 days ago. My walking dendro is now getting picked on by the uh, Japanese pygmy angelfish. So I put it in a cage to protect it. But then today, I don't know who did it, but the cage is off and uh, it's out in the open. So I've got to go retrieve it and I guess move it into the reef. Um, and just so it can be okay because I'm not happy with it being at risk or I don't like it to be nipped at because it's been closed up and looks sort of like a cashew instead of like a really pretty coral like it normally does. It's been fine for so long. I mean, coming up on two years and for the last few weeks it's been shut down. <clears throat> so thanks for the tip there. Uh, Evan says, is the audio off? I don't know. I just do the best I can. What's funny is other people say it looks totally fine for them. And I never know how to fix that. Jordan says, every coral in my tank died and I'm in the process of restarting. It'll be seven years old this year. I am so sorry to hear that. I mean, what happened? Tell us. Hey, Amy's here. Hi, Amy. She's a friend of mine. <laughs> So let's see. All right, so that was it. Let's go back to our topic. Let me jump back to where it was. And we're going to drag this guy over here so I closer to my camera. So um, when you are going through reef depression and, you are, and you've analyzed and figured out what is going on with the system to where you know what to address, then what you want to do because you're still depressed don't try to do it all in one day. Don't, because number one, here's what's gonna happen. If you try to solve everything all at once, you probably won't do it because your commitment level is so low right now because of the depression. So while you're in this funk, while you're in this situation to where you're really not motivated to do anything, make little tiny steps. And that, that's literally what they do with you in, in therapy. They want you to try something small, something you can handle this week, and then we'll talk about it next week, and then we'll see if we can add one more thing to your schedule. So your your reef tank doesn't quite have the three-month uh, or six-month therapy process because there's life on the line. Everything in there is living, and it, it, re it relies on you to stay alive. So we can't go too slowly with this, but what you can do is you can say, what can I accomplish today to get me in the right direction with this tank. You know, what can I start off with? And it's basically, I'm just saying to use little baby steps. So you know, naturally, I'm going to tell you, especially on a Saturday, it's water test Saturday. So test all your parameters. That'll take you about 20 minutes. And then you can just kind of take a break and you can just say, okay, I did that today. But then tomorrow, could you do another small thing for the tank? And if you could give it a little bit of time daily or every other day, that will probably well they definitely will help your tank over time versus just spending a lot of time on it today and then ignore it for the next eight weeks you know because that's what i think we as humans tend to do we we put in a ton of effort and then we expect fantastic results and we want it to just take care of itself now because we spent all this time on it and that's not how this works because it's an ecosystem that's out of balance and we're trying to bring it back into balance and it's going to take a series of things so I'm going to talk about my tank and what's going on with it because that's the easiest way for me to correlate uh, a uh, plan of action. And then you could look at that and say, okay, well, what can I do with my tank that's the similar thing? So first thing we do is water test. Um, that doesn't involve any cleaning whatsoever. We're just scooping out some water, going through the test kits, doing the thing, finding out the numbers. And now we at least know what's incorrect when it comes to water chemistry. And if the water chemistry is all perfect, then great, you, <laughs> nothing to be upset about. You know, so that's a good thing. You can literally take it off your list and not worry about it whatsoever. But 
If you do have a problem with water chemistry and like you're just like, wow, my calcium is crazy low and you've tested two or three times to double check. And that's a really important thing to do when it comes to testing water. If you do a water test and you get a weird number, the first thing I do is test it again and then test it a third time. And that way, let's say I was measuring calcium and the test kit came back 200, which is unheard of. I would just, I would just be like, what? There's no way. And I would dump it out and I would do the test again. If it came out 200 again, I'd be shocked. And so then I do it a third time. And if three times in a row I get 200, then I'm like, okay, tank's literally down on, on calcium or this kit is completely lying to me. It's one of those two. So I would want to, you know, if my kit is relatively new and it's something I trust, I would believe it. If um, it's dated or you know, it's near the end of the bottle, I'd be like, all right, let me get a new kit and just double check one last time. And if it's still measuring low or Alternately, you can take a water sample to your fish store and say, could you test the calcium, please? And just tell me what numbers you're getting. And they tell you, yeah, it's 200, it's 210, it's 190, whatever. You're like, okay, I need a dose calcium chloride. And so you would mix up a solution of that and you can add it manually daily. It's not hard to do. You know, you could use the reef chemistry calculator, which exists on Google. It's there for you and it's super easy to use. You put in the total water volume of your tank, you put in the current calcium level, you put in the desired calcium level, which might be 400. And then you would say what you're using, calcium chloride, calculate. And it says you need, you know, based on the size of your tank and, you know, the liquid you're using, you're going to need this much. And then whatever that number is. So let's say you know, I needed, I don't know, a liter of calcium chloride mixed up in solution. I wouldn't pour a liter in my tank and bring it to 400, but... I could take that liter and I could break it up over like seven days and I could pour in a little bit each day um, in an area of high flow. Or if I was being super lazy, I would then hook it up to a dosing pump and let the dosing pump squirt in a certain amount over a slow period of time, you know, 10, 20 minutes daily until the liter is completely empty. And then, of course, double check the water and make sure that it's not getting too high. And that's another thing that, to do when you're trying to make a correction with a element in your water column don't put it all in at once, but measure more frequently. So like, you know, the calcium situation, if if I was trying to bring it up a small amount, like let's say I want to bring it up 50 ppm, I might choose to put in, and so I've done my math and it says you need this much liquid. I might take 50% of the liquid and put in the tank and then measure the next day and see if I hit that number or not. And if I did not, I could put in the rest of my solution safely and then the next day test again to make sure I actually hit the target level I wanted. If I didn't, I need a little bit more. If I hit it and blew it out of the park, you know, it went a little too high. It's like, oh, don't use any more for a while. So that's one of those things. But if your water chemistry is actually fine, you don't need to worry about that one now because now it's not the problem. It's going to be something else. Then the next baby step with your tank would be to start cleaning things off. And, you know, normally I just take a bucket of water and a sponge and I start wiping down everything inside. <laughs> I wipe down the top rim of the tank to look at the top to see if there's anything obvious up there, if there's some weird accumulation of something. Um, I also look above the tank to see if there's anything dripping into the tank from the light rack. Is there anything on the light fixture that's giving me concern? You know, I want to look at that. I want to, if you have any wires near the top of your tank, you know, the cords coming off of the lighting, for example, or off an auto feeder. Is there anything in there that is rusting or is there anything that is cracked open that could possibly be uh, poisoning the water, so to speak? You know, we want to make sure we want to rule things out. That's the part of the process. We know water chemistry was great because we tested the water. So now we're looking for a contaminant and where it's coming from. Um, in my tank, you know, I, I tend to keep it clean. I also like to clean the top edge of my sump and I like to wipe down the inside of the walls of the sump from time to time. And that allows me to verify that I can see in there easily and I can start looking at things and I can see if there's something really gross in there. Like, for example, what if I had a cucumber in the sump accidentally, you know, it just crawled there and it was getting chopped up and sucked into the return pump and just slowly, you know, putting toxins into the tank as this thing is being minced and shot back up in the tank. Uh, that kind of thing can happen. An anemone going through a power head is another way to basically start poisoning all kinds of stuff in the tank as the nematocysts are going everywhere. But these are very obvious visual things you would normally see. If your sump is really, really dirty and you're having problems with nutrient levels being too high in the tank, 
It could be time that you need to siphon it all out. And there's the uh, VCA vacuum attachment you can hook up and you can vacuum all that stuff out. You can use a shop vac and you can literally pump out all the water out of your sump with a big pump. Like I really like the uh, Ultra Zero from CJ, which sucks down the water to about this deep. And then you could take a shop vac to get all the detritus and stuff out and slurp it all out and have a nice clean sump and then, you know, get things going again. But while you're in the sump, you want to look at other things. Is there something that you're using, some kind of magnetic holder of any kind? Uh, do you have a frag rack down there for some reason? Do you have a uh, probe holder down there? Do you have a, um, a dosing tube holder? Any of those things that could possibly be a magnet that is split open and leaking, that is something you want to, you know, obviously investigate. If it's bad, throw it away, get a new one or go alternate, you know, with some other system. Like I saw someone recently posted this week, I had a tubing, dosing tube holder. I don't trust it anymore. You know, the magnet split on it. I'm thinking I wanted 3D print something. So can you make something that can hold this in place that's different? Yes, there's all kinds of solutions. Uh, you want to make sure that the 3D printed part is being printed with the right material. <clears throat> I believe, but I could be wrong, so don't take this verbatim, it could be PLA is fine, um, but you want to make sure it's not the other stuff that's not fine because we're, again, it's a live ecosystem. We want to make sure it's safe, but we want to make sure everything's secured and in place, and we want to verify that uh, it's not going to slowly poison the water of the aquarium because, you know, invariably it'll affect the health of the fish or the affect the health of the corals, or uh, it, that's really the only two. <laughs> I'm trying to think, what's the third thing? There is no third thing. So, um those are a couple of steps I would take. Uh, another thing that you want to look at as your time allows is cleaning up your electrical stuff to make sure that you don't have something that's shorting out into the system or leaking electricity in the system. Now, this is one of those things where it'd be really smart to actually know if you have stray electricity in the water. And if you have a ground probe on the tank, you probably wouldn't feel uh, if there was a short. And uh, so if you remove the ground probe, <laughs> and I'm not saying test your tank by just risking your life, but a lot of times we end up, this is how it's discovered. You have a little nick in your finger, you got cut by something, and then you reach in your tank and you feel that tingle inside that cut. And you're like, oh, what was that? And you're like, it wasn't a fish biting me. And you put your finger in it again, you feel tingle, tingle, like, oh, wow. So something's leaking power. So now you're gonna wanna figure out what it is that is uh, causing this problem. And um, the ground pro protects you. It's not there to protect the tank. It's not there to protect the livestock. It's to divert the stray electricity right back into the ground line of your home and get it away from the tank so that you don't get hurt. But um, if you want to measure, I have an article about how to find stray electricity in your aquarium. Uh, I'll try to remember to put it in this video's video description so that way you can read it later on when you have time. It's not hard to do. You just need a voltage meter. And it can be a digital one or it can be an analog, it doesn't matter. Either one will, either the needle moves or it doesn't, right? But I remember a long time ago, in my 280 gallon, I had a problem and uh, I felt the tingle. And I went through and I checked and I uh, found one ancient power head that still worked. It wasn't broken, so I was using it. And it was leaking something like 48 volts into the water, which was a lot. And I removed it and resolved the problem. But, you know, you wouldn't know it unless you were testing for it or, you know, cutting your finger and sticking it in the water. <laughs> now, by the way, it's not slice your finger, put it in the water. Please don't do that because that is uh, completely different. And there's a chance that you could actually get some horrible thing in your bloodstream through an open wound. So typically when you have a cut on your hand, I would say don't put your hand in the tank. But sometimes, like I said, we're just working on the tank. We recently got nicked and then, you know, we work in there like, oh, What's that tingle? That's your heads up that something's not right with the, uh, the electrical of the system. So uh, now here's the other thing that you need to keep in mind as you're trying to resolve the problem with your tank um, is that you may have a problem that is just so large that you couldn't address it one day safely. I mean, yes, you could spend 10 hours on it just to get it over with, but it's not good for the health of the livestock. So for example, if you had a huge aptasia outbreak in your aquarium and it's really getting you down and you see it's not only a plague that seems to be un unbelievably overwhelming, 
it's also stinging things you care about that you've spent money on. And you're like, oh, now I'm losing this torch. Now I'm losing this. Now I'm losing that. I'm like, my zoanthids are all closed up. You know, whatever it is. When you've got that kind of situation, you might say, I need to kill them all. I need to kill them all today. Well, that's not usually going to work out in your favor because it's too much chemical in the water. If you're, you know, I'm trying to think of different ways people kill Aptasia. And normally it's putting something on them or in them you know, like injecting them with something. Now, if you're injecting them with boiling water, that's not really going to hurt your water column, you know, so that would probably be okay. But if you killed a thousand in one day in your tank, it's going to affect the water column to some degree. It absolutely has to. There's no way it couldn't. If you're using a laser and you're cooking them one by one, it's just too much at one time. So instead, I would say work on a section of the tank at a time, you know, we're, you know, I don't know what size your aquarium is. I'm, we're talking about my 400 gallon, right? So I would look at maybe a quarter of my tank and I would look to kill off those in one area and then give the tank a break for a few days and then tackle the next area and then a few days and then go to the next area. And then finally, you know, two weeks later, I'm doing the fourth area. And then, of course, on the fifth week, start at the beginning to see if there's any stragglers, anything I missed that I should have taken care of. And that way you're doing it in small bits and you're not going to hurt the health of the tank. And that's really important. And this goes along the same thing. It's, it's the exact same principle as when you're trying to plant fragments in your reef tank and you've got this two-part putty that you mix up and you're using the putty and you're gluing the corals down. If you glue down 100 frags in one day, you're going to have protein skimmers overflowing or collapsing where they don't skim at all. You're going to have fish acting weird because there's too much of that putty stuff in the water column. And you might even change the clarity of the water. It could look all mucky. And that's because you use too much uh, putty. So instead, plant a few, give it a break for a few days, do a little bit more, give it a break for a few days, and plant the last of them. That is your smart move. And that way, you are doing this in a way where you're not adding too much chemical to the tank at one time, and you're not going to harm it. Now, uh, as I said, with my reef depression that I'm dealing with right now, I have Mahanos kind of everywhere, um, and they're humongous. <laughs> they're like big, beautiful sunflowers. It's ridiculous. And my copper band does not care about them one iota. I have no Aptasia, but I got Mahanos that are just, there's too many. And, you know, for a while there, I had probably, I don't know, six or eight that I was aware of, and now there's just so many. I've got these other anemones that are just prolific in the tank, and they don't belong in there anyway. And I was okay with a handful. Now it's ridiculous. I pulled out probably 40 a few months ago. And, uh, you know, there's just way too many. And I've got to strip them out. So the Mahanos, I will be using uh, FFtasia on those. And I will work on a group, an area. And to do that, I have to turn off the flow in the tank for an hour. So that's the perfect time for me to remove all the Vortec powerheads and put them in solution to clean them and investigate their magnets to make sure that the magnets are still safe and usable. And then I will apply the Aptasia on each Mahano. I'm also going to be aware of any livestock beneath the Mahano. So if any of the Aptasia rains down, it doesn't land and sting what's beneath. Like I have a pagoda cup that's kind of in a bad spot right now. And if I were to hit the Mahanos up in the middle of the rock work, it would drizzle on that and kill the pagoda cup. So I've got to remove the pagoda, put it somewhere else temporarily while I'm working on the tank. And if I just work on that one area and clean up the couple of vortex, that already make me feel a little bit better about the tank because it's something I haven't been taking care of in a while. And uh, then on the other end of the tank, I've got some stuff. It's the same principle. I got Mahanos causing chaos. I got some anemones that don't belong. And I've got some corals that are uh, really shrinking away because of being stung by these pests. So I've got to go through and handle that. But I'm going to do it at a different date. Uh, so I'm not doing it all at the same time. So I'm not affecting the water chemistry of the tank. I'm not adding too many toxins to the tank. Um, I'm trying to think if there was a, another project in the tank that needs to be done at this time. Really, anything else is going to be taking place in the sump, checking the gear. And that means removing the protein skimmer entirely from the tank to get the pumps out of the body because they're within it and see if there's a problem with those. I had ordered uh, a replacement pump a month ago or so, and so I'm planning to replace one for sure, but I wanna see if maybe I just have this bad magnet that is causing the problems that um, is going on. 
in the tank because I don't know what it is that's happening. But it's I've never seen this problem before and it's bothering me. But at the same time, I've just been so my schedule's so full that when I'm not busy doing something, I'm just trying to relax and take a break and uh, just, you know, stay healthy. Right. I mean, that's the thing. You know, if you have too much going on, um, that can be just as overwhelming and it can affect your, your entire mood, your whole personality, and, of course, your level of depression. All right, let's see. I say we just jump to the live question, the live chat again. Let's just jump right now. All right, let's see where I left off. <laughs> um, Triggerfish says, last week one of my light power supplies died, having... All that light gone significantly interrupted the photosynthesis and my alkalinity climbed to 12.6. I had to turn the dosing pump off. Yep, that makes sense. The um, The fact is, is that whenever we have something change in the tank, it will completely affect other parameters with it. And we need to go ahead and make sure that we've got everything with a backup. <laughs> so like, for example, on my main reef, uh, I had a power uh, X8, uh, XHO power strip, no, LED strip, that one of the power supplies apparently was flaking out. And I was up on the light rack and I made some corrections and it came back to life. It's like, okay, good. And then finally it just died. And then I was trying to get a new power supply and it took a little longer than I wanted. And then when it finally arrived, I had to have the energy to install it, which you think, oh, no big deal. Hop up there and just swap it out. But everything's a project and nothing's quick. Nothing's ever... 20 seconds and it's done. You'd think even that would be an easy one, but eh, I've got wires going through cable management and I had to go remove the old and put in the new and then hook it up and make sure it works. And it does and it's good and it's off my list of things to worry about, which made me happy. But while it was off, was that part of why I'm losing some of these corals? Were they not getting some light that they're used to getting because of that one strip of light that wasn't on? I don't know, but I do think it's something else. Um, Amy says, I find that actually working on my system helps me with depression. I spend all day, every day working on tanks and sometimes it gets old. But when I start working on my own tank, I fall in love with it all over again. Good comments. I appreciate that. Um, Smeds Pet says, this summer I bought some expensive fish that I didn't quarantine and got flukes, which is kind of easy to treat. I was frustrated all year. Now I've successfully quarantined two blondes and I'm very happy. Okay, uh, talk to us about these blondes. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, Rick says, a theory, when dosing lanthanum chloride to reduce PO4, it settles on the sand and can cause a good area for dinoflagellates to grow. Well, uh, I don't know that I can agree with that theory, but yes, it could potentially settle. That's one of the reasons why uh, Blue Life has been encouraging people to use filter socks to capture it as quickly as it's going in the system. Um, and I always say running a protein skimmer should capture it. And if you have in-tank flow and you've got the skimmer and you've got the filter socks, between all that, you should be able to capture it. Now, my glass was really dirty this week and, I mean, just filthy. And I thought, I need to dose lanthanum. So I went ahead and I put in my uh, phosphate RX, <clears throat> knowing that it would stick to the algae on the walls of the tank. And then I could uh, cleaning magnet it away instead of it sticking to the clean glass. And so I thought, two birds, one stone. I'm going to do it this way. And to be honest, I didn't. I expected the algae to look whitish, and it didn't. But I do know it knocked the phosphates down again where they belonged. So that was a good thing to do. But um, you know, over all the years that I've done ICP testing, you would think, especially since I've been dosing phosphate RX for more than you know, probably 12 years now. I was going to say more than a decade. You would think at some point I would get a result on one of these ICP tests saying your lanthanum is sky high, but it's always below natural sea level, which is, or, you know, natural seawater, which is interesting to me because I'm always expecting the worst, you know, because, you know, I've been using it and using it and using it. But I mean, when I say using it, I use it maybe six times a year. And that's not a lot, you know, you know, six days out of 365 days, that's a very small amount. If I was using it daily, if I was using it 52 times a year, like every single week, maybe that'd be different. But I find that just using it as needed has always worked for me, and that's why I've leaned on it that way to manage, manage my phosphate levels. <clears throat> ah. 
Mina says, thanks for your help yesterday. Ironically, I briefly mentioned reef depression in my article. <gasps> you were reading my mind. Maybe it was coming off of my texts. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Amy suggests don't forget about the flipper or the glass scrapers in your tank. Those can also be a source of a bad magnet. Possibly. I'm not saying they're bad magnets. I'm just saying whatever magnet. I use the, uh, I think it's called algae float, which is the one that inside the tank will float upward. The outside looks like a piece of wood. And I'm going to double check those to make sure that they're still safe and that they aren't a problem. I'm going to check at my, I'm going to also look at my Nori Nibbler. I'm going to look at my uh, Two Little Fishies uh, feeding clip. You know, I mean, there, anything that's got a magnet, I'm going to be checking it because I'm going to find out what's going on. Lord Thornton Eddington says, "How? what is the best way to prevent scratches on the glass while using magnetic scrapers? I've got a strange looking blemish that looks like uh, tiny chips have been taken out. Oof. Well, the scrapers themselves on a glass tank, you know, like usually it looks like a Velcro pad on the inside pad, you know, the part that goes back and forth. That normally won't scratch the glass. However, if grains of sand get into that Velcro and then you go back and forth, the sand can scratch your glass, but it won't take out little chips. That usually comes from taking a metal tool and really scrubbing away, like trying to, let's say you allowed a coral to grow up on the glass, which I do all the time. And then one day you're like, I got to get rid of this coral and you're trying to remove it and it won't come off the glass. And then I'm like chip, chip, chipping away with a really uh, a long tool that has a metal blade and I'm just like, whatever. And I know I'm kind of wrecking the glass, but at the same time, this coral has got to go. And that right there uh, is the worst thing I could possibly do. I mean, you shouldn't do it. A friend of mine years ago actually asked me to invent, you know, he came up with the idea, showed me a prototype and says I should make these and sell them. And I never did because it's again, involved magnets and I don't sell anything that has a magnet. You know, I don't do it. I don't do it. Uh, maybe I should talk to someone else about doing it. But anyway, I'll tell you. <laughs> should I tell you the idea? <laughs> anyway, here's the idea that he recommended. You have this area. Um, you have this thing you're going to put in the tank that's on the inside against the glass. And then on the outside, you've got whatever holds it in place. Typically magnets, right? And inside that area that is on that thing on the inside of the tank, you fill it with muriatic acid. You use like a syringe and you just flood it full of acid and let it just work on and eat away the thing on your glass you want gone. So if you had you know, a real stubborn coralline, whether it's glass or acrylic, you could put this device in place, fill it up with the acid, let it work on it, and then you could vacuum it back out with a syringe and then move it to the next spot and flood it with acid again and kind of work your way across and basically make this stuff loose to then clean it off with something that's not going to destroy the the glass wall of the tank. And at that, that point, you might be able to scrape it away with something as easy as a plastic credit card instead of using metal on it or a razor blade or a, a scraper that's hard. Now, um, I think it's a great, I actually thought the idea was great, but making it and making it work successfully, <laughs> that was the challenge. And then thinking about how badly it could go wrong for people that are you know using it like on a smaller system because they're like, oh, this is so cool. Let me try it out on my 12-gallon tank. <laughs> and you have all that acid in the water, you know, because it came off and I forgot to drain it first or something. I just, the liability part of it kind of made me nervous. But for those people that have bigger tanks and, you know, areas that are really hard to get to, this method of affixing this thing to the glass and filling it up with an acid and then, you know, removing it, I thought was brilliant. I thought, man, I love that idea. <clears throat> But uh, back to your uh, comment, Lord, I do want to say that it would be really good to stay on top of cleaning your glass regularly because wherever you do have scratches or chips in the glass, that is usually where new algae is going to attract and it's always going to be a blemish. So by staying on top of it, it, it keeps that little void uh, empty. So that way uh, it, it doesn't become an eyesore. But uh, the longer you ignore it, the longer you take between cleanings, the more likely something will grow in there. And uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to say it's going to be in there, like, take root and can never come out, but it will be extra effort. If you stay on top of cleaning more frequently, it tends to go away, you know, stay clean longer. But um, unfortunately, you have some little chips in there. Uh, Panopolis says, is there an ideal time of day for photo period, uh, of the photo period to test alkalinity? Um, 
You know, it was, um, what is his name? Jim Welsh was the one that noticed that alkalinity was being taken up during the light cycle and not being taken up during the nighttime. And so he, based on his frequent tests, like testing every 10 minutes all day long, you know, he's the one that made the automated alkalinity tester that later on became the Trident. And when he was doing his tests, he says, I actually know for a fact when the corals are absorbing the alkalinity and using, utilizing it versus before we just guessed and we just assumed and we didn't know. But you were saying, is there an ideal time of day to test? Um, I'm going to say no. <laughs> and the reason I'm going to say that is because usually when we're testing, we want to test at the same time for consistency reasons. So like if every Saturday you tested your tank at 10 a.m., every Saturday, like clockwork, your water should be about the same in all values other than, you know, what's being depleted and being replenished with new uh, solution being added to the tank. But if you test at 10 in the morning and you test at 4 in the afternoon, you test at midnight, you you're all over the place. And because of that, you, you lack the consistency. Um, think about it. If you test at 10 o'clock in the morning and your lights haven't been on yet, the corals aren't utilizing the alkalinity yet. If you test at 4 o'clock in the afternoon during the time when they are using it up, that's going to give you a time of reading. If you test again at midnight, it's the end of the day, and it's also before you've dosed any, you're going to have a different reading. So it's actually, I think it's really better to test at the same time daily, and I'm pretty sure that's what happens in public aquariums. You know, everyone has their assigned tanks to take care of, and they're told to test their water every single day, and when they do it, they probably, you know, make their cup of coffee, <laughs> punch into the time clock, and then go test all the water before they do anything else that day. And I think that that kind of consistency will give you more accurate information. Now, if you want to test early in the day, later in the day, and then, you know, toward the evening and just kind of see what kind of numbers you get and kind of find what is your sweet spot, you could do that. But I don't think that you're going to get bad results in the morning and great results in the afternoon is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Aquaball says, I was using Fritz RPM Red, Red Box. I do water changes every two weeks, 30%. My wife bought the blue box. Is it okay to change from red to blue? My tank is only five months old. My corals and fish are happy. Well, I'm glad they're happy. Um, I'm going to tell you that you can just switch from red to blue and it's okay. I know that a lot of people tend to think that when you're switching salts from one brand to another, and this is the same brand, so it's not even a different company. Uh, they think that these should be gradual and do little tiny water changes to kind of let the reef get used to the change of flavor of the salt. And I kind of get that, but at the same time, I think we're putting a little bit too much human into the salt mix. Salt is salt. What makes the mixes different, typically, is the additional ingredients. The additional uh, calcium, the magnesium, the potassium, the iodine you know, the, the different trace elements, the things that are put into the mix when they make it, that's where they vary. But the core is salt water. And uh, so I have done in the past where I switched to brain of salt. You know, I, I had oceanic salt for a while and then I switched to Red Sea and I used that for a while. And then um, I used Fritz for a while and then I used uh, Aqua Vitro for a while. And then I went back to Fritz again and that's what I use now. And I just do a water change. I, I don't think I need to like mix the two brands together and to make this mega mix or this, this combo mix and then do a water change. I don't think your tank is going to notice. But if you want to be, you know, hedge on the safe side, do smaller water changes with your new brand of salt. But you went from blue box or red box to blue box. And the only difference between those two salts is the level of alkalinity. So when you do a water change where the alkalinity of that box was 11, and then you do a water change with the box being eight, that is where your tank would notice the difference because it's not getting the alkalinity boost that it was used to getting. So I would say in that case, you'd want to um, find that, you know, doing a smaller water change won't affect as much of the water column because you're only doing a very small partial change, you know, 10%, 15%. That's not going to have a big impact. When you're changing 50%, that's where things matter and it becomes a lot more important to make sure everything's equal. 
And ultimately, when it comes to water changes, I always recommend your salinity, your temperature, and your alkalinity are the same. And if they match, you can basically change as much as you want safely and not have anything go wrong. And like I said, you're going from Fritz salt to Fritz salt. I don't think you have to worry at all about uh, doing different things with your tank. Winter Water says, last week I decided to blow off the detritus trapped in my rock work for the first time. Um, the next day I noticed my euphilia was not opening up like before and some white slime started to come off of it. So I took it out and I dipped in iodine. Most of the heads are open, but some are still looking rough. Should I dip it some more? Um, You could dip it again in a, after a few days. I wouldn't just dip, dip, dip because you're just going to terrorize the coral basically uh, you know just too much shock you know too much happening at once uh, but normally blowing off the detritus in your rock work is good for the corals uh, the corals might have eaten some of the stuff that shouldn't have been eaten at the time but usually it recovers from that and um, getting in the habit of blowing off the rock work on a regular basis is really a, a smart move and it's good for the tank because it gets stuff into suspension so it can be caught in the filter socks in sponges in a fleece roller or in the protein skimmer. So this is a good practice to get into. And, you know, if you did it for the first time in forever, yeah, I could see where your tank kind of would be like, what the heck just happened? But uh, the next time you do it, there's less being kicked up. And then, you know, if you're doing it every week or every couple of weeks, then it's just part of the uh, the weekly thing and the, the reef just kind of reacts, you know, in a way sort of like, like a feeding response almost. Now, um... If you were to blow off the uh, euphilia, you know, accidentally, because you're trying to blow off the rock work, you could have maybe torn some of the polyps. You know, it, it's a possibility. And so those large stony polyps, you know, you have to be careful with them because that's a lot of meat and um, it doesn't, doesn't do well with a lot of flow hammering away at it and it can actually affect the coral. So you want to make sure that when you are working the tank, whether you're using a turkey based or, or a very small power head and you're working your way through the reef, that you're really aiming for the rock work. And once your rock work is completely covered in corals and you can no longer blow off the rock work, then it's really a matter of maybe using lesser flow to blow off the corals. And that in by doing that, you're first of all getting rid of trap detritus within the corals. And you're also like if you have Montipora that are swirling, you won't have a depression filled with detritus because when you blow that off, there's a dead spot. Uh, so by keeping all this stuff off the coral so the coral stays clean, all the polyps can continue to exist and not be smothered and murdered by, uh, by waste. Um, you'll also help the coral shed a little bit, which is a good thing. So you can do that when you can, like I said, if your corals grow so large and you no longer see the rock work, you can't blow off the rock work, but you can still gently blow off all the corals to help keep things cleaner in the system. Remember that as your corals get bigger and bigger and bigger, like in my tank, the flow in the tank itself becomes reduced because the corals themselves are impeding the flow. And so by going through and doing that reef reset that I've uh, talked about many times on this channel with Dwayne, you have made big corals into smaller things the size of a fist. You've increased the flow around the fist and there's more flow through the tank, which is good for everything. But as corals become, become bigger and more dense, flow is reduced. It affects everything, including the oxygen levels in the water. So I wanna make sure that we are making sure we have good flow in the tank at all times. Um, Triggerfish said, I knocked my auto feeder into the tank the other day. I managed to dry it out and it worked till it didn't. <laughs> and dumped out all the pellets in overnight. Phosphate spiked, uh, but it was back down in four days. Whew. I've actually had something similar happen. Uh, I had one where uh, the auto feeder was on top of this thing that I call the, the Eheim chimney for the Eheim auto feeder and Spock went up in the chimney with her big head and pulled the entire thing and the feeder into the tank. And it, it was actually falling in the water, spinning and food was going everywhere. And uh, I had to use phosphate RX to get it back out of the system. And it was a big mess. So I redesigned the feeder chimney to be different so that Spock's mouth could get in there, but she couldn't pull the whole thing down. And of course I secured it to the tank with Velcro. But um, that time, it was just like a fluke accident. And I was like, oh, are you kidding me? Um, WMR says, I've been wanting to get to try the auto feeder from the light rack zip tied. 
So the only downside of having an auto feeder way far away from the water is that there's a possibility that your food will hit the surface and it's dry food and it'll just drift across the top and go right through the overflow box and down into the drain and all the food just ends up in the sock because the food doesn't have a chance to get wet to sink into the system. But if you can create something down low on the tank, some kind of a thing that catches the food as it's falling from the light rack, like a funnel, then the food will sit there in, within the funnel on the surface of the water. And of course, all your little fish are gonna go to it because they get used to it. They learn that spot. They, they become very in love with that spot. Uh, they're enamored with it. And they will go there and they will, their little mouths will go choo, 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 choo. And as they're doing that, they're actually making the food wetter and they're causing it to kind of tumble around and it starts drizzling into the reef. So yeah, if you could set up something underneath it, some kind of a feeding ring is one method some people use, but I really think a funnel would be better if you can stand looking at it to capture what's rained down into this thing and starts sitting on the surface of the water, that'd be better and keep it from going down into the, uh, the sump and the filtration. All right, let's get back to our topic. Not that I have a lot more to say about it, but ultimately when it comes to reef depression, we want to get over it <laughs> the sooner the better because as I said earlier, the life of your livestock is on the line. And if you ignore it for too long, if you just let it get further and further away from uh, proper care, then you're gonna start losing things. And as you lose things, it could become a domino effect of loss of life. And you start losing more and more corals, or you may lose fish. And uh, you know we already know how difficult it is to get good fish that are uh, that adapt to the tank, that accept the food, uh, that look nice and healthy. That's already a big challenge in itself. And if you are losing healthy fish because you're neglecting the tank, then you're going to have to go through the battle all over again of getting a new fish and get it acclimated to the tank and get it to get along with the population. That's, that's really hard. Uh, whenever we introduce a new fish into the tank, we usually hope that everyone will like it, but there's no guarantees. And you could put in this fish you've always wanted in your existing population of fish. And then the new guy is released into the tank and suddenly you see chasing happening and you, uh, you see fins are being nipped and torn and you, uh, you might even see an outbreak of disease on the newcomer because it's so stressed. And these are all terrible things. And we don't want that to happen. So it's one of the reasons why you don't see me posting a lot of uh, stories of me buying fish <laughs> or uh, buying a new fish. I'll buy corals on a regular basis. I mean, I'm like, oh, I like that. I'll take that. I'll find a spot, which I usually don't have. But I still will try to find a spot. But fish are so challenging. And when you've got a nice, calm ecosystem where all the fish are getting along and they all have their territories, whenever I want to put in a new one, it's really hold your breath and pray. I mean, you really don't know that it's going to work out in your favor and it could end badly. And you kind of know that when you buy it. I mean, if you don't know it, now you do. There is a chance that what you're buying may not make it just because the other fish may not tolerate it. They may not have one more nook in the rock work to, to allow this newcomer to call home. And that is, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. So we don't pack our, a matter of fact, you know, a long time ago, my dad said, where are all the fish? I said, they're right there. There's one, there's one, there's one. And he said, it's like you, you fill the tank with corals and you decorate with a few fish. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I do. And that's just me. I've seen uh, other people that have way more fish in their tanks. And um, I kind of am envious of that a little bit, but I'm not envious of the fight to successfully have more fish in the tank. And I would rather have an easy to maintain ecosystem than to be pushing the limits and trying to get away with something like to have every wrasse, for example, or to have all the tangs or to have all the angelfish or whatever. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm more about keeping it reasonable and being content with what I have. But if you're dealing with a funk that is affecting your taking care of the tank on a regular basis, you have another option too. You can always call a maintenance company to help you with a tank. So let's say you're really, really depressed and you're really frustrated. 
you hire a service to come in and you have them work on the tanks so you don't have to. And maybe they do that for a couple of months until you're back on your feet again, until you've got the motivation to work on the tank yourself. It's going to cost you more money, obviously, than if you're doing it yourself. But at the same time, they will change the water. They'll test the water. They might remove some things that are decaying because, you know, it's being neglected. And um, they might even incur, they might even spot a problem. And like, oh, well, there you go. This, no wonder you've had this problem. You put an algon in your sump, you know, a year ago and you never took it out, you know. And that's been helping cause problems in the tank ever since. And it was just a slow bleed. So, you, you know, having an extra pair of eyes on the tank could be helpful. So those are kind of all my thoughts today when it comes to reef depression. I do want to encourage you to always think about the life of the animals in the tank. And I mean, it's hard. When you are depressed about something, you barely want to take care of your own life. You know, you really don't. You're kind of like, ugh, whatever. And there's that mental hoop that you have to somehow jump through. You have to find a way to get out of bed each day. You have to find a way how to make a healthy meal. You have to find a way to, you know, deal with other people around you while you're dealing with this crushing thing that's going on in your mind. And when you're in those situations, all I can do is say, you know, these animals completely rely on you. I mean, a person that's depressed still has to take care of their dog or their cat. And the aquarium's the exact same. It's another pet. And that pet has specific needs that cannot be ignored because it will die. Just like if you stop feeding that dog or you stop feeding that cat, uh, you know, it will decline. It will do worse and worse. It'll start tearing up your home or whatever. It'll eat you while you're in your sleep and <laughs> come devour you. Uh, we want to make sure that we're taking care of our pets. And uh, the reef tank is no different and it needs that attention. And so I highly encourage you to, again, figure out what the problem is, schedule some time to work on it, and then do it in baby steps. And I think if you do those things, you will turn it around. And as it's turning around, that will help with your feelings, which will help you kind of negate the depression and alleviate it, I guess is a better word. And it'll start to lessen and lessen. And then at one point your tank's looking better and you're like, okay, I'm feeling a lot better about it now. And that'll change everything. And if you have not added anything new to your tank in a long time, sometimes that's another reason why you're, you're in a funk about the tank. It's, there's nothing new or interesting to you, you know, because, you know, you put all that energy in the beginning and now it's just kind of like an autopilot and it's kind of like whatever. So by getting that new thing for the tank, a new invertebrate, um, a new, I, I said fish, but I mean, you know, you might find a new fish and it might make you happy. <laughs> uh, for me, it's corals and vertebrates. I love adding something fun and interesting. It could be a very specific hermit crab uh, that, you know, the markings on are really pretty. It could be the pom-pom uh, crab, you know, that has the little anemones that uses like little fists of fury. Um, it could be the arrow crab. It could be a type of cucumber. I mean, there's a lot of neat things you can put in the tank that are really pretty that will give you a fresh perspective of the tank because there's something new in there that um, draws your eye to it and you're curious about how it's doing and you're, you're checking on it and you're feeding it. So keep those things in mind and hopefully whatever it is you're going through, like I said, will pass. I mean, it will. This will pass some way or another. Of course, it could pass completely when you just get rid of the tank and you just don't have to think about it ever again. But I don't want you to do that. I want you to just enjoy your tank and I want you to not feel overwhelmed by it and overly frustrated. Now, obviously, the bigger the tank, the more of a challenge that is because there's so much to work on and everything you try and do to solve the tank costs a lot of money. And that's one of the things I'm dealing with, but I'm okay. I'm, <laughs> it's not the end of the world for me. I'm just dealing with his thoughts and I thought this would be a great topic for today. And that's why I brought it to the channel today for you guys. All right, let's jump back to the Q&A. See, that timer doesn't even count. I'm about to change that timer. Because <laughs> I said you'd have to wait 12 more minutes, but I didn't have 12 minutes of content. I'm not here trying to burn minutes so we can jump to the question and answer. Let me just go to your questions. <laughs> Will, you're going to have to go to the beginning to find out what's going on. And Lord... Thornton, I did mention the consultations at the beginning. Okay, Baker's Reef, uh, thank you for chiming in. He said, I can completely relate to uh, dealing with 
uh, five months of severe depression and my tanks were basically on autopilot and it took months to get them back up to par. That's one of those things that, I mean, I was talking specifically about reef depression and that is something that I feel is real, but at the same time, it could just be physical depression, depression of, you know, end of a marriage, loss of life, um, losing your home, whatever it is that that right there could affect your persona completely, which would then affect, you know, keeping an aquarium successfully because, you know, you've got bigger fish to fry, so to speak. But again, if, if it's that kind of depression, it may need um, professional consultation to help you get through that because we definitely want to be healthy individuals and, uh, and be happy. I mean, we all within ourselves have an innate desire to be happy. And, you know, the more things go wrong around us, the harder it is to find that happiness. But there's always something that is out there that can bring you happiness. So I want to encourage you, you know, if at all, to find that happiness within you. And so as you work your way through the different situations and you're trying to come to terms with what's really first and foremost in your mind, you know, get that assistance however you can. Uh, there's different ways. Um, I remember uh, during COVID, I was trying to get therapy. And uh, of course, you couldn't see anyone in person. And I felt very much that I needed that. I already talked to people through a computer screen. The last thing I want to do was get therapy through a computer screen because I feel there's this, there's this wall between us. It's just not the same. Even, you know, a FaceTime call or a Skype call or one of those things, they're, they're not like being in the same room together talking and breathing the same air. There's just a difference. And so I actually sought out and found someone that could talk to me in the same room. And uh, we did it, like I said, for four months. And it helped me a lot. But um, and the funny thing is, there's not one thing in those four months that I can say that's what changed everything. It was literally just talking it out, getting it out of my system, crying my way through it, you know, the whole thing. I mean, I was dealing with grief and uh, it was it was huge. And um, my goal wasn't to like be cured. It wasn't to get over the grief. My goal was to get back to work. So I set a goal. And it's the same thing I talked about with grief, depression. You need to figure out what's wrong with the tank, what you're trying to correct. Basically setting a goal of what you're trying to achieve. And just saying the perfect reef, that's uh, very vague. That's not accurate enough. But if you are trying to... Um, trying to solve specific problems like loss of coral, unhealthy fish, um, algae woes, you know, that kind of things. Once you know what the problem is, then you can start to tackle it with solutions. You know, you set these goals, you're working toward those goals, and finally you achieve those goals, it will completely change your whole feeling about everything. Jason says that if you're depressed, you should eat a fish cookie. And what he means by that is a a cookie made of fish. <laughs> um, Winderwater says, is there any idea what would make a chalice coral bubble up? You mean where some of the skin is literally becoming like lifting off the skeleton? Because I haven't seen that. Um, that could be a chemical reaction. It might not be a good thing. I'd actually need to see pictures. If you could stick that in a post on Club Milo's Reef on Facebook, that would be helpful. I'd like to see this. Uh, Robbie's Reef says, I had a major tank depression for about eight months. Nearly every day something was going wrong, even uh, was causing friction with my spouse. I worked through it with the help of another reefer. <laughs> Such a good point. Yeah, I mentioned calling you know, someone that's a professional uh, or you know talking to uh, a maintenance service. But also, yeah, if you have a, a friend... Who, or a club member who's near you that is also into reef keeping, they already understand what you're going through. And the fresh set of eyes, again, can really help with uh, getting through situations. Ah, the bubble already receded. It sounds to me almost like it was skin lifting off and was maybe so stretched that it finally died and left a bad spot. And unfortunately, that may not grow back. Sometimes it can, sometimes it won't. It just depends what happened. Triggerfish. Of course you'd recommend a male blue throat trigger for my tank or a, as a new fish for my tank. 
Um, not a bad idea. They're they're actually really pretty. Um, that's, who knows? What if I actually did it? Then you'd take all the credit. <laughs> You're like, that was my idea. He did it. I might do it. I've never kept a trigger. I've never bought one in my life. Uh, Andrew says, I broke down my tank just before Christmas to catch all the fish to treat for velvet. That's a tough one. Uh, I went fallow for two months, and now I have ick, and I've lost two fish. Going to have to go fallow again for another 75 days, and it sucks. Yeah, that does. That does. I agree. I'm sorry you're going through all these fish diseases. So um, the fish that are in quarantine, you're going to want to treat them to remove all trace of ick. And, uh, you know, you've already handled the velvet part miraculously. Good job. So because when you put that fish, those fish, back into your fallow tank, you don't want them to break out nick again one day, right? So we want to make sure that all those fish and any new fish you buy in the future are going through quarantine. Um, I would put them through safety stop as long as you don't see ick. It says right on the package, do not put an ick infested fish in safety stop. So don't do that. But if you're buying a new fish and you put it through safety stop, that is like the first barrier of knocking off external parasites, then put in quarantine for observation. And if you see it break out an ick, then you got to treat it for ick, you know, one way or another, whether it's a tank transfer method or you're using um, hyposalinity or you're going to use a low level of copper, you know, whatever method you're going to use to eradicate the ick, because you, you want to eventually have the new fish completely healthy so when you introduce it into your tank with your existing tank mates, they don't get sick again. Because, yeah, you don't want to keep going through these two-month fallow periods. It's too much work. It's too much effort. It's too much babysitting of the quarantine tank to make sure everything's okay. And we want to make sure that um, the hobby is enjoyable. Because it, 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 it can be. It can be really enjoyable. And I've never had this type of recession happening in my reef tank. So it's kind of why I'm in this negative mind space right now. Because, you know, normally if there's a problem with a coral, it's like, okay, whatever. There's 90 other corals. But I'm just watching systematically a problem here, a problem here, a problem here, a problem here. It's like, ugh, it's too much going on. I need it to stop. Let's see. Uh, Gabriel says, I have a 180-gallon tank with a six-line ras, chromus, and tangs. I introduced five peppermint shrimp last Saturday for Aptasia, and seven days later, I have one shrimp left that's always hiding. The Aptasia are alive, and but the fish aren't chasing them. Uh, first of all, peppermint shrimp are nocturnal. They come out during the night and, you know, when the lights are out. So are you positive the other four are gone, you know, that only one survived a week? Because there's a chance they're still in there somewhere. Or there's a chance that something in your tank eats uh, uh, peppermint shrimp. And that would be negative. But, um, yeah, you're on the right track. I mean, peppermint shrimp are known... As, there's a certain type of peppermint shrimp that are known to eat Aptasia. They're not all created equal. And I know for the longest time here in the city I live in, Dallas-Fort Worth uh, Metroplex, uh, every store was selling some type of peppermint shrimp. But Frank was, you know, at Frank's Tanks was telling everyone, I have the only ones that will eat your Aptasia. <laughs> so he got all of us convinced to go buy his and put those in our tank and uh, eat the Aptasia. But, um, I mean, you said only one's alive. So I'm just asking, are you positive that their other ones are gone? It does, it's not quick, it's not overnight. The only way it's overnight is when you take a rock full of Aptasia and you put it in a separate tank and you put all the peppermint shrimp in there with it. Yeah, they'll pick it clean within hours because there's nothing else going on. There's no competition. There's no fear of fish. You know, it's, it makes a great video. You know, like, look at this. Look at them just devouring them. And it feels really nice to watch the Aptasia go away. But in a reef tank, stuff takes longer. And you want to make sure you don't have something in the tank. I mean, you told me six-line wrasse, chromas, and tanks. None of those fish sound to me like peppermint shrimp eating fish, but can't rule it out. It is possible that one of your fish wants shrimp for dinner. I mean, it's a possibility. Maybe the hippo tank, you know, if you have one of those. I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, Baker's Reef says, I cured my reef depression with a new small build and a biota captive regal angel. And I've watched it uh, from the size of my thumbnail to almost two inches now. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I think a new build can be really inspirational. Also, um, and this wasn't even part of my, my notes, but it just popped into my mind. Another way to uh, get out of a depression, you know, that... The, ah, we're all in our own homes with our aquariums, and it's kind of an isolation when you think about it, even if it's with family members, but it's your tank, you're, you're isolated. You're not going to a monthly club meeting and hanging out with other hobbyists. You're not hanging out at the fish store for a couple hours at a time like you might have used to done in the past. All that's changed. Ever since COVID, it's sort of like in and out, stay six feet apart, <laughs> or whatever. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, just it just feels differently now. But if you can do it, Going to a local event in your area, whether it's a frag swap or a bigger show like Aquashella, Reef of Palooza, Machina, uh, what else is a Reef Stock? And those are the only four that are on my mind right now. But if you can go to a show and walk around and look at all the different booths and you look at the stuff, you can get inspired just by being around all that activity. It can be really exciting. And of course, if you come home with something new for your tank, that's always fun too. And it can help with your mood. So, you know, if you're going to a frag swap, you're going to be shopping for frags. You know, you're looking for something specific. And if you go there with something in mind, like I'm looking for a yellow coral. I mean, there's not a lot, but you might say yellow zoanthids, yellow leather. Um, uh, I think there's a yellow <coughs> uh, parites maybe. Uh, but I mean, if you said I need yellow in my tank and so you went shopping for that, not just getting whatever's pretty, but literally trying to think about the colors that are lacking in your tank, that would be the right move. Let's see. Will M says, is it normal to not use a skimmer? I've not been running one on my 75 gallon tank. It has been uh, maintaining a nitrate of 15 and phosphate at 0.12. And now I'm using a 30 gallon sump as a frag tank. Well, is it normal to not run a skimmer? I'm gonna say no. <laughs> I think that we all agree a protein skimmer is super beneficial to a tank. And so most everyone that gets a reef tank going typically has some kind of skimmer on the tank. And, um, Matter of fact, I was watching a, a video that something YouTube suggested to me recently. This one channel was like, uh, you need this skimmer. And I was like, all right, let's see this video. <laughs> and he never showed a skimmer. What he showed was a fleece roller. And I thought, why did he call that a skimmer? And the whole video never once was a protein skimmer brought up. So either he was thinking surface skimming or he was thinking the fleece roller skimming the water column of whatever, but it was not a skimmer. But a protein skimmer is always helping drive away CO2, which is important because it helps with raising pH levels in the tank. It does not add air to the water, which is something everyone believes, including myself. I thought that too. I really did. I thought, look at those air bubbles. It's literally making air, but it's not. It's really driving off CO2. And when you turn off the protein skimmer, the CO2 level rises higher in the tank. And when you turn it back on, it, it pushes them out and allows the oxygen level to rise which allows the ph to rise so having one on the tank would be the norm and to run a tank without one would be um less normal to me uh, i've always recommended every reef tank should have a sump it should always have a protein skimmer that's just my my recommendation and uh, i think that it's ideal for the tank because it's always running all the time and if something weird happens in your tank it starts to capture it immediately if it can um our protein skimmers the foam within them can change based on what we put in the water column. Certain oily foods like PE mices can make the foam collapse. And um, adding fresh water, like too much fresh water at once, can affect a protein skimmer. Using uh, two-part putty in the water column can affect the protein skimmer. Uh, and of course, using something like ChemiClean can definitely make a protein skimmer turn into a volcano and overflow like crazy. But uh, normally having a skimmer on the tank it would be the norm, the number one recommendation. And in the current issue of Coral Magazine, the one I showed you guys earlier, um, this one here, right here, the one on filtration, 
Daniel Knopp uh, wrote an article in this issue. This is the one that's currently available from millersreef.com or, of course, at your local fish store. And if you need this issue, please order it from my website so I can ship it to you so you can read it. But for the longest time, he felt that you only need to protein skimmer for the first few years during the dirty cycle, like during the ugly phase and kind of just pulling things out. But then after that, you could basically remove the skimmer and put it away. And I was like, really? He believed that? And he said, yeah, after that, from year three going forward, no longer need to have a protein skimmer. And I was like, wow, I can't believe he wrote that. <laughs> but then he said, I have come to change my mind on that. I feel like the protein skimmer is essential and actually crucial to maintaining a reef tank. And I, and that's what I believe too. So I was like, okay, that makes more sense to me. So, you know, I read a lot of different things as we work on new articles for Coral Magazine. And so I get to hear other people's uh, viewpoints as I'm going through these things, proofing them for typos and stuff. And um, I was relieved that he didn't still believe that because I was like really, really surprised. So I, you know, yeah, I would say having one on there would be great. Now, if you don't want to have one, that's okay. Caitlin's Reef's been running for almost two years, no protein skimmer whatsoever. Kind of want one on there at this point. Kind of want a sump on there at this point. You know, it's I ran the tank the way I thought she'd run it. But, you know, it's coming up on two years and I'm dealing with these weird issues that are just irritating me. And I just want to move forward and get back into what I'm used to with my own filtration and, uh, you know, do it. But that tank's not reef ready. It's not drilled. I don't want to use a hang on back overflow box. Um, I don't have room for a sump underneath at this time because of all my electronics down there. So that tank is in stasis, but it is a very natural run reef at this point with... Uh, power head and um, an air stone, which might be unusual for most people. And uh, an in-tank filter to kind of capture some particulates and allow me to run some carbon in the water to keep the water more clear, which is definitely doing that. Tyler says, my tank's 180 gallons and it's been overrun by mushrooms. I know, I know, I should never put them in there. You're right. <laughs> you should never have done that. So what's the best way to remove them from the rock in the tank? Well, I'll tell you what we did with my tank. Uh, I had mushrooms galore. And the problem is mushrooms don't just walk across the rock and become more. They will actually spin until they tear themselves off and they'll land somewhere else and connect to a totally different rock on the other end of the tank. So what we did with my tank, I actually put a big tarp down on the floor in my living room and I took the rock out of the tank and I handed it to a guy that was sitting there on the floor and I said, your job is to scrape off every last mushroom so there's none and then hand me a clean rock and then take the next rock and do the same thing. And he scraped off hundreds, if not thousands of mushrooms off those rocks. And uh, when he was all done, I was like, okay, good. My new tank has no mushrooms. This is fantastic. And then like within two weeks or so, I saw little baby bits of mushrooms like, no. So I was in there with dental tools, you know, chipping off the last of them. But that's, that's it. You want to use some kind of a tool to remove them from the rock. And it's really hard to do it in your tank. It's really basically impossible. On my website, I sell something called the work tray and it will fit on the top of your 180 gallon tank. You take the rock out of the tank, you put it in the work tray and you can scrape off the mushrooms one by one. Wear some eye protection because they'll squirt. And then go ahead and scrape them off and turn the rock and scrape and keep doing that. And ideally doing it on the top of your tank uh, under your lights the lights will make the mushrooms kind of show up a little bit more readily so you see them and you don't become blind to them. Because if you do it in the sink, everything kind of looks the same brown color or whatever, and you're just like, eh, I think I got them all, and you don't quite notice. But then after the rock is nice and clean, put it in the tank, and then take the next one out and do the same thing. And don't do it all the same day. Take a, take an area, tackle it, like I said earlier with the you know, Mahanos, and just work on the tank a little bit at a time. Your tank is six feet long, maybe tackle a foot and a half, two feet, and then you know next week take on another couple of feet. And yes, it's going to change your aquascape, but it's the only way to get these mushrooms out. There is no trick to removing mushrooms easily from rock. It really is a matter of scraping it off. And I just, like I said, I use dental tools. I found these things. Um, actually, huh, I got mine from the dentist. I just said, I want those. And they are like, you got any tools you no longer use? You know, you don't trust them in the human mouth. I'm like, yeah, I still have some. I'm like, I want to get some of those from you. And they had some that were very sharp and pointy. They had others that looked almost like... Um, what could I compare it to? Kind of looked like a duck's bill, if that makes sense. You know, that it was kind of rounded over and very thin and I could just get under the edge of the mushroom and just kind of peel up the meat off the rock and then I would just work the entire foot off. And if there was any skin left, I just scraped the rock to get, remove any bit of tissue. 
And if you get rid of all the tissue, that mushroom's gone. If you leave any bit of the meat behind, that will grow into a new mushroom. I mean, it's literally how they propagate themselves. Nope, a protein skimmer does not aerate the water, despite what we might think. Um, Ruben says, so if a skimmer doesn't put air into the water, into the system, what well does? And don't tell me the pumps in the tank circulate in the water. I feel the skimmer should aerate the water because it's drawing in air. <laughs> um, if you were to run a Venturi tube into a power head that's drawing in air from outside, that's blowing straight into the tank, that in theory could add some more air. This is not my strength, okay? I'm, I'm telling you, this one topic, I was shocked, but it, the person that told me was Dr. Craig Bingham, and that guy knows everything. And when he said this, I just took it for I just took it at at face value. I didn't get into huge debate with it. I was like, wow, I never knew that. So, you know, there's people that say, oh, if you'll just leave your protein skimmer running with no cup and let it overflow, you're adding air to the tank, but you're not. And uh, all you're doing is creating a volcano in the sump with spatter everywhere. So anyway, what I'll do for the next uh, the next live stream, I'll get with Craig and get some more facts on that one so I can answer you guys. But um, yeah, there is a difference. It's not, it doesn't suddenly, you know, you know what adds more air to a tank? I think, and I could be wrong. Like I said, I'll talk with Craig. But um, I think running ozone because that's O3. So you're adding an extra oxygen molecule and that usually is pumped into a protein skimmer. <laughs> So you would think if the skimmer is sucking in air, it's got all this extra air, then why would you ever need ozone? But no, people pump in ozone to add more air to a protein skimmer filled with bubbles that you thought was full of air. So it's not. Um, the reason we have air pumps with air stones is to put air in the water, but it, it's more than that. It's really to put um, circulation in the water. So anyway, that is a, I, I'll get more information on that one and we'll talk about it next week. Okay, we'll have a whole thing about it next week. I think that would be a good topic. Uh, Baker's Reef says, I just subscribed to Coral Magazine. Will I be able to get previous issues you worked on or will it just be the new editions from the date I subscribed? So if you subscribed like this month, you will get the next issue that's coming out, which will be the May-June issue. And that will be our, our uh, magazine on coral diseases. I don't know if I've shown you guys the cover. I don't know if I have the cover ready to share. Let me find it. Give me a second here. Um, I'll show you guys our new cover. I remember the first time Matt shared this before the magazine came out. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know we were allowed to do that. <laughs> and I joked that I thought I'd get fired. Let's see, cover. I want the small cover. That's not it. Where is it? Oh, I'm in the wrong folder. Hang on one second. Covers. You wouldn't believe how many folders I go through daily. Okay. Here is our next issue called Coral Diseases. And this magazine has four, no, five articles about coral disease. And so if you subscribe now, you are going to get that issue, that issue, and you're going to get five more because you get six uh, magazines per year, you know, for the annual subscription. Now, if you want previous issues of Coral Magazine, you can order them directly from CoralMagazine.com uh, in the back issue section. You can also get issues from me and Mila's Reef because I stock them. And <coughs> I probably have the last six or seven issues on uh, my website right now. So you can just say, I want this one and this one and this one and this one, and I'll put them all into a, a package and ship them your way, and you could get totally caught up. Above me, behind, I'll go ahead and remove that from the screen if I can find it. Let's see right there. So above me there, you can see that I've got, let me move this a little bit here. You can see I've got three issues on the wall. Those are the three issues that I've already made or produced or, or you know been the executive editor of, and this one about coral diseases is going up there next. So I'm going to keep putting magazines up on the wall there behind me as they come out. And uh, I can only put up six a year, so it's going to be a slow burn. But I think it'll be really cool having those um, up there on the wall because there's a lot of work involved in making each issue as I make them. <clears throat> yeah.
Yeah, I'll be happy to do that, Ruben. Ruben says, I think it'd be a great topic about air exchange into our systems. I'm going to get some more information, and that way I'm not just talking off the cuff and I have some facts for you. I'll do a little bit of homework for you guys. <laughs> so it's something to look forward to. All right, um, you know what? I think we're just going to transition to this. And let's see what happens here. And uh, remind you that uh, today is water test Saturday, and it's really important that you test your water to make sure that the water parameters are good because water tests save lives. I want to encourage you to do this like I do every single week because your livestock will absolutely benefit from the extra effort you do to verify that your alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, nitrate, phosphate, salinity, temperature, all those things are correct. Uh, if you have other things you're testing, whether it's potassium or you're measuring uh, ORP, you know, these are all good things to know and track to make sure they're okay. And if you can, you should save your results in ReefTrace, which is a great little app that lets you, that works on iOS and on Android. And ReefTrace will let you track your water parameters and graph it over time. And you can see how you've been doing. You can also keep notes in the app and verify that you're, uh, that you're keeping up with changing your carbon regularly. You can also have it send you reminders to say it's time to change the GFO or it's time to dose per Dibio or it's time to, you know, send off an ICP test. You can do any of the reminders you want. There's also a local fish store uh, map built into it that is super handy. Um, wherever you are, when you open the app, it will look within a 45 mile radius and tell you if there's any fish stores near you that you can go visit. So I highly recommend that app to you. I think you'll really enjoy it. I think it's become so much more beautiful than when it was first made, uh, what, three, four years ago. And um, it's, it's a very practical app and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, other than that, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's live stream. And, uh, you know, I hope that if you are dealing with reef depression, that some of the things we talked about today helped you a little tiny bit. That was my goal. I, you know, obviously, I, whenever I do a stream, I'm trying to help you to uh, succeed in what you're doing. And, uh, you know, this is one of those topics that it's it's hard. And there are times where we just have to plow forward and take one little step after another, you know, step by step toward the goal to make things the way they should be so that we can begin to feel better. So I encourage you guys to, you know, take care of your mental health, take care of each other, and I hope you have a happy Easter. And I will see you guys again in a week. Bye.